We're working on it. <laughs> so is there anyone here who hasn't been here before? All right, there's a few of you. So um, you drove by the other building, which was the Great Bay Discovery Center, which is sort of the educational hub of the Great Bay National History and Research Reserve. We're part fish and game, so that's why if you see anyone with this, that's a staff member here. And we're also part um, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. And then we have a great friends group, the Great Bay Stewards, who help us fill in the gaps um, with funding. And we have a lot of different types of programming here for little toddlers all the way up through programs like this for adults. Um, and our website's super easy to remember. It's just greatbay.org. So you can keep an eye on our calendar there if you're ever looking for anything else uh, here. And so this is our third lecture of the winter. Um, this winter has been all about birds. So it's been a really great series. It's been really well attended. I'm glad that um, even though we had to reschedule, most people were able to come to the new date. So it's great. So this lecture is all about eagles. So I think everyone's probably really excited because it's just one of those animals that everybody loves. And Chris Martin is our speaker. Um, he's with New Hampshire Audubon. And he's done various raptor monitoring projects from ospreys, falcons, eagles. Um, and he came to New Hampshire in 1990. And originally he thought that maybe he wanted to be a forester, but then he kind of fell in love with birds. And um, now he works with birds. So I'm excited to see it. And I hope you guys are too. Uh, we are recording this lecture. Um, so if you ask a question, the camera might, uh, might pan to you, um, but it'll be pretty far away. So should be good. <laughs> Chris, if you want to get started. Right. It's great to be here. Uh, when uh, Melissa mentioned um, the Great Bay Stewards, it made me remember back when it was the Osprey Stewards back in the early 1990s. That was the first stewardship group around this center. And uh, that was back when there was one pair of Ospreys in Great Bay. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so that was the, actually the beginnings of, of the stewards program, and it's a good program. So if you're not involved in it, you should be, because uh, uh, volunteers make uh, all our organizations run, including New Hampshire Audubon. We, uh, I, I work with dozens of raptor monitoring volunteers, folks that uh, want to do something that helps us uh, keep track of uh, our, our rare or threatened birds of prey. and. Um, People come at it with different amounts of skills and abilities, but uh, they adopt a site or a place that they know well or is close to home, and they all become really good observers over time um, by practice. So uh, it, it gives us data from all over the state. So uh, volunteer programs are really important in natural resources. So yeah, I can't say enough about that. So today we're going to talk about bald eagles. Uh, that's a species that was federally endangered um, in the 1970s, 1980s, and 90s, uh, has been recovering for many years through a number of things we're going to talk about. Um, in New Hampshire, uh, this species was on our state endangered list as well and moved to a state threatened in uh, the early 2000s. That was... Uh, um, that was uh, we were seeing the, the species increase to some degree, but in 20, or 2017, we actually removed, well, we didn't, New Hampshire Fish and Game removed the bald eagle from our state's threatened list uh, by virtue of, of recovery. So this is a case of a species that has, uh, for all intents and purposes, recovered, yet we're still monitoring them uh, because they tell us a lot about the environment. And I'll, I'll get to that here shortly. So if everything goes according to plans, this should work, right? Oh, that didn't work. <laughs> How about that for a start? Am I pressing the wrong button? It's the arrow button. Let's try that way. That was the reason. I pressed the wrong direction. So uh, four-year-olds know what bald eagles are. They can recognize the white head and tail. It's, it's one of the first birds that uh, people learn about in their lives. Um, and it's interesting because a four-year-old today uh, doesn't think a whole lot about uh, the fact that we have bald eagles. Uh, but um, when I was four years old, you couldn't find bald eagles. They were very rare. There were only 700 pairs in the entire lower 48 states. Now there's probably 700 pairs in the state of Maine. So to give you some idea of the change. Um, DDT and other toxic chemicals were really impactful in all of our predators, especially our predatory birds, and caused them to delay the thin-shelled eggs that wouldn't hatch. So for several decades, from the 1940s on, 
we were seeing um, really poor reproductive success from our adult eagles. And those baby eagles were the ones that were gonna replace the adults in 10 or 20 or 30 years. So after 20 or 30 years of this problem, all of a sudden, lo and behold, we didn't have any young eagles to step up and, and take the place of the older ones that had passed on. So that was, that was the crux of our, of our population crash that occurred in the 1950s and 60s. Um, so as I mentioned in the early 70s, uh, the federal government listed them as federally endangered, the highest level of concern. They were one of the first animals put on the new endangered species list in the early 1970s. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, we've, we've had a good recovery with a great deal of effort over a long period of time. And in New Hampshire, they're no longer listed as threatened or endangered as of 2017. These guys do live 20 to 30 years. Um, not all of them live that long. Uh, many of them die in the first year because they are learning the ropes, trying to figure out how to, how to survive and are unsuccessful for one reason or another. But ones that go through an annual cycle or two or three, learn to master their environment, learn to master hunting, uh, get familiar with the territory, and um, may live 20 or 30 years. And we know a lot of that from ID bands that we've placed on the birds to track how long they live. Because they, once they get to be adult plumage birds like this, you can't tell how old they are. They don't get gray or anything like that. So. Um, these are aquatic animals at the at the heart. They are uh, they're they're not great swimmers, although they can swim sometimes um, by using their wings to propel themselves. Believe it or not, but almost everything that they're interested in eating has some connection to aquatic ecosystems, whether it be fish or ducks or or muskrats. I love this set of pictures. Just want to mention these shots here. I'm showing you are by a photographer who just got really fascinated with bald eagles, uh, name of Jack Dorsey. Um, he's passed away uh, a year and a half ago, so we don't have him around anymore, but uh, that's just spectacular shots. I love those. This is from Great Bay. Um, actually, it's not a really, a really a new picture. Uh, these days, you can find six or eight bald eagles in a collection around a food item like this with some frequency in the winter. Um, when this picture was sent to me, this was very unusual to see this many eagles together um, in one spot. They will uh, pick up anything that's that's dead. Uh, they'll uh, tear up uh, a dead duck, and and pieces go all over the place. And then they all they'll pick on the ice. If you know anybody who does ice fishing, they uh, all the all the bait that gets tossed out on the ice at the end of the day, or the sandwiches that get tossed out on the ice at the end of the day. Um, get get scavenged by gulls and crows and ravens and and bald eagles. Bald eagles take the place in the winter time of our turkey vultures, which usually leave the state in the winter months. Uh, I've noticed in the last week they're back, um, and I'm not sure some of them ever left this year. But uh, um, in the winter, bald eagles fill that scavenger role very, and they do it very well. Uh, in addition to fish, both live and dead. They will eat gulls that are injured or dead, um, muskrats, herons, ducks, geese. This is a shot from the uh, um, Hampton and Seabrook marshes, not far from here, of an eagle going after a red-breasted merganser that it can see in the water. See it chasing the merganser there? Around the corner, the merganser dies, but it can't stay down for very long, and eventually, the eagle picked it up and flew off with it and brought it to its mate. <laughs> and so uh, eagles do hunt as pair sometimes. Oftentimes uh, uh, the one is watching the other while it's hunting. Uh, they have territories that uh, may be four or five miles across um, that they get to know really well. And bald eagles are usually in those territories year round. They don't migrate to the Chesapeake Bay in the winter. They don't migrate to the tropics like our ospreys do. Um, that's one clear difference between eagles and ospreys is eagles are here year round, cold weather doesn't bother them. That's uh, it's par for the course. Um, it's always a challenge to try to identify a younger 
bald eagles, though, because they have such a variety of plumage types. Um, the, the first year birds are almost all brown top to bottom with just a little bit of white on the underneath side, sort of scattered around. Uh, but as they age, they start to get all kinds of strange patterns of white and, and, and dark feathers uh, sort of in a mottled pattern. These two birds then here are two different age classes. Uh, this, is, this is a spring picture of on the left, a one-year-old eagle, one that hatched the previous spring. It has an all dark beak and um, generally dark feathers. Now the one on the right, you'll notice, oh, I didn't mention one thing. The one on the left, the young one, has an all dark eye, a brown eye. The one on the right, if you look closely, and I, this isn't the best uh, lighting to see that from back there, but that bird has a slightly yellow eye. That tells me that it's a year older than the one on the left side. Um, it's also starting to get patches of white in various spots. That's quite typical. The other thing is, they start to get more yellow at the base of their beak. And over time, that yellow works its way out to the tip. So you can get some idea of ages that way. So this is a one-year-old and a two-year-old immature bald eagle. Um, that plumage, that mottled brown and white, helps them a lot to blend in, to, to be camouflaged. Uh, adult eagles are really, they don't camouflage very well. They're usually pretty easy to pick out when they're perched in a pine tree. But I was over at Chapman's Landing in Stratum just half an hour, four, well, an hour ago now. And an immature eagle like this one came along right on the Squamscott River and landed in an oak tree across the river. And we lost it. I mean, it was right there. We lost it until it decided to fly again because they blend in so perfectly with the birch trees and the other shades of gray in the background. So in the winter, that's perfect camouflage. Uh, but the variety of types is really the amazing part. Um, some of them have white bellies, some of them have white packs on the back. Um, some of them are almost blonde in color and it's a real challenge for some people to identify them as eagles for that reason, but their size kind of gives that away. They, uh, the most common thing people say to me is, I think I saw a golden eagle. And 95% of the time, it's an immature bald eagle. But it's possible to see golden eagles in the state of New Hampshire. It's not completely out of the question, especially in the winter months. Uh, we have golden eagles that migrate south from places where they breed in eastern Canada. We once had nesting golden eagles in New Hampshire as recently as around 1960. These birds nest on cliffs, similar to peregrine falcons. They don't nest in um, trees on lake shores. They nest um, in mountainous areas. Um, but in the winter, uh, they come south. Some of them come south. Some of them go all the way to the Appalachian Mountains um, down in Tennessee and North Carolina. Um, but they're very distinctive in several ways. This is a, a great picture of a golden eagle on a food item in uh, northern New Hampshire in Coas County. Um, they almost always have this bright blonde patch on the back of their head, which is hard to see if it's up in the air, but um, they also don't have any yellow on their beaks. Their beaks are all dark and they have feathering on their legs that goes all the way down to the toes. It, that's, they're like wearing uh, woolly socks. Uh, bald eagles have skin showing on their legs, yellow skin. So uh, that's one very distinct difference if you're lucky enough to see one this close, which almost nobody is. So, uh, and the younger ones have, uh, I've probably got a pointer in here somewhere, but it doesn't matter. The younger ones have distinct white patches on the underside of their wings, about midway out to the end of the wing. And they have a white stripe at the base of their tail that's distinct, kind of like, almost like a Northern Harrier has, uh, but it's, it's, it's a distinct white section on their dark tail. So that's how you tell an immature golden eagle from a bald because their white patches are all just all over their body. They're not, they're not organized like that. So it is possible to see one. I'm hoping that before I retire, we'll have nesting golden eagles in the state again, but um, I may have to retire sooner than that. We'll see. <laughs> um, 
as young bald eagles get older, uh, they, their plumage gets organized more like you expect an adult to look with a partially white head in a three-year-old bird uh, and a mostly yellow beak. Um, <clears throat> and then in, <clears throat> excuse me, their fourth year or so, they get a nearly all white head with a few dark spots um, and a beak that is yellow, except for a little bit of dark on it as well. But for all intents and purposes, this is an adult aged bald eagle um, in terms of its breeding and holding territories. And they could even uh, lay eggs and, and try to raise young at this age. So this is a four-year-old bird. That's about the time we discover new nesting pairs in the state. If you like the seacoast and you spend time in Rye, uh, between Eel Pond and Rye Harbor right now, there are two eagles of this age, four-year-old birds that are clearly in courtship. Um, and essentially forming a new breeding territory at the present time. And they're pretty easy to pick out because they, they perch in the biggest trees that, there along the coast. Uh, we haven't found a nest yet. So if you happen to be in Rye and you see an, a, a nearly adult eagle and it's carrying sticks or grass, pay attention to what direction it's going because you could help us track down where their nest is if they indeed have one yet. So we're expecting that'll happen sometime soon. So you didn't know you were going to get an assignment. <laughs> Again, another look at a four or perhaps even five-year-old eagle. Just a few hints of that immature plumage left. But then from this age on, they will look um, the same year to year to year to year. And you don't know if it's seven years old or 22 years old. It, it will look the same. And male and female are the same? Male and females have the same plumage. I'm glad you asked that. I should have said that right off the bat. The same plumage, females are bigger than the males. Uh, in mammals, most of the male mammals are larger than their female counterpart. But in uh, birds of prey, it's almost always the other way around with the females being bigger than the males. So, but the identically, they look identical in terms of, of the pattern. So, what is also true is that eagles are bigger than ospreys. And, um, this picture not only shows that size relationship, but it shows the ecological relationship as well, which is that ospreys catch a lot of fish, but sometimes eagles take the fish away from them. Um, and ospreys are smart enough to know that if they want to fish another day, they might just have to drop their catch and try a second time. Um, so bald eagles not only hunt and scavenge, but they intimidate and, and they're able to get food by virtue of their size and the threat that they pose to a number of species, not just ospreys, but things like great blue herons. Um, that's, that's kind of ugly when you see a great blue heron get rid of its catch because it keeps it down in here, yeah. has to spit it out. Um, but like I said earlier, they perform a really important function, especially with these large animal carcasses like deer carcasses or moose. Um, Eagles are one of the few things that can open up the hide on a carcass like that. And they then make it available to everything from mice to chickadees to blue jays to crows that can't open up those, those carcasses as easily. So coyotes and bald eagles uh, perform that role for all the other animals that scavenge. And it's, uh, it's an important function. Um, I think most of you probably come across an eagle by surprise. Um, in a place you didn't expect it, like on your drive through the grocery or something like that. Um, eagles don't nest just in wild places. They're in our cities. They're in very busy areas. I, I stopped at Amoskeg Falls in Manchester this morning to check on a nesting pair of eagles right there next to the Amoskeg Bridge, if you're familiar with Manchester. Um, it, Cities don't matter to them. It's, it's as long as there's food and shelter and uh, they can get some buffer between them and the disturbances that, that we create, um, they're going to be uh, perfectly happy. And so um, eagle pairs are filling in gaps up and down all our major rivers in the state, the Connecticut, the Merrimack, uh, the, the uh, Kachiko, the Piscataqua, um, the Androscoggin, all those major rivers. Um, at one point we had territories about 15 miles apart. 
Now we have them not only seven miles apart between territories, but pairs moving in between that so that the distances are two miles or less between neighboring pairs of bald eagles. And I've got some data that shows the growth of this population. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, rivers are really important for eagles because typically that water stays open for long periods of time in the winter. It's rare for it to freeze over totally. And that means it draws things that need water. It draws the ducks, it draws anything that needs water to survive. And that means more uh, potential prey for the eagles. Uh, and eagles in the winter sometimes gather in larger groups and roost, which is what they do overnight, um, in trees together. Um, maybe one nesting pair and a pair of adults and a bunch of young that are probably not all related to the, uh, to the adults. In fact, probably almost all of them are not related to the adults. They're just drifting around and they, they come across this, this uh, communal roost and they'll spend the coldest nights of the year together in that roost, sharing warmth and sharing information about uh, where the food is the next morning when it's time to get out and, and get some food early in the day and warm yourself up. So a lot of social interactions between adults and immatures. Here's an immature coming in here, thinking it's gonna land on the, on the best branch. And the adult is saying, oh, no, you don't. That's my branch. And look at the other adult down there, seems to be very interested in what's going on. Um, as if he's, that one is checking out what's going on with the, uh, its mate above it. So then the smart immature who's learned their lesson is over here on the upper left, just going, oh, you should have known better than that. Right across from us, um, over by Adams Point, is a, a place called Wilcox Point, which some people in this room know very well. And uh, it's an area that is conserved and has been since around 1990 or so, um, conserved as a wildlife management area, which people can use uh, for recreation and enjoyment. But unlike almost every other wildlife management area in New Hampshire, it has a seasonal closure in the winter months from December through the end of March. That is because one of the main reasons it was acquired uh, 30 plus years ago now was because that stand of pine trees there was frequently used by bald eagles for an overnight roost site. And at the time, it was one of the few locations in the state that we could identify that had those qualities. And so uh, um, that's an area that, um, that eagles still use regularly, both day and night, as a spot to uh, roost overnight. And uh, we see evidence on the ground when we visit the site in the spring that eagles were there over the winter because there'll be feathers and droppings. And like most birds of prey, eagles cough up the undigestible food in something called a pellet, which instead of going out the, the backside comes out the top again. It's uh, feathers and bones and hair and things like that. Um, that don't pass through its digestive tract. Um, so you see evidence that these birds were there, even if they're not there when you visit the site. So, and I just wanna mention again, it's a site unlike almost all our other wildlife man management areas that is closed to public use in certain times of the year to protect the natural resource that helped acquire it to begin with. I just said that, didn't I? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm getting ahead of my pictures. Uh, so if you want to see bald eagles this time of year or when there's a good covering of ice on, on Great Bay, this is a great spot because, you know, there's seals, there's lots of ducks, there's fish, there's maybe not horseshoe crabs yet, it's a little early for that, but there's all kinds of things that, um, that uh, they can scavenge. And, and there are deer that think they can go across from one side to the other and don't, sometimes don't make it. Um, these eagles didn't kill the deer. They're just scavenging on what's left of it, so. Now, um, I was talking to a group of middle schoolers this morning and we were talking about data and what scientists do. And scientists are big at collecting data and, and looking at trends. And that's true of wildlife biologists as well. And uh, graphs like this really explain what's going on with our eagle population. This is a graph of a count we did for 40 years in the state from the early 1980s until just a few years ago, the year two, uh, 2020. Uh, 
of a one day midwinter count on a statewide basis of bald eagles. And the lines in the graph, the, 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 the bars are, if you're, a, if you're a white part of the bar, you're an adult eagle. If you're a brown part of the bar, you're an immature eagle, okay? So that makes some sense, I guess. There's a few little spots there that are an odd color. Those are eagles we couldn't identify as adults or young because the view was so brief that we don't know for sure which age class. But you'll see that since 1980, the winter population of eagles in the state has grown at a very steady rate. When you think about it, over the course of 40 years, um, we we actually stopped doing that count uh, a couple of years ago after we hit 100 eagles in the count. Um, not because we hit 100, but because instead of all 48 states doing the count, it was down to about 22 states that were doing the count. And uh, uh, we saw the writing on the wall for, for this as a national count at that point and decided to use our time um, in other ways besides that. Plus, when we do this count in January, we're only a few weeks away from the start of the eagle nesting season, which begins in February. So uh, we were gearing up for that um, rather than counting our wintering eagles. But these are the kind of eagles that will use those overnight roofs that I was mentioning earlier, like the one at Wilcox Point. Uh, but I want to shift and talk about uh, breeding season, which, as I said, begins as early as February. Actually, it begins earlier than that because eagles are paired up year round. They actually do nest maintenance in the winter months. Um, even in November, they're, they're working on their nest to some degree. And uh, these pairs are sizing up their territory, trying to figure out if they, well, oftentimes they actually have a second nest, an alternate nest that they maintain to a greater or lesser degree, uh, which is an insurance policy in case the tree their major nest is in uh, blows down at just the wrong time, like the week before they're going to lay eggs, something like that. So you've got a second um, alternative to fall back on. Um, actually, this, this is that, that pair in rye I was mentioning, this young pair. Picture was taken just a week ago. You see, both of those birds have dark on their tail. They're, they look like adults, but they're not quite. They have little stripes around their eyes. And if you could see their beaks, you'd see they have a little bit of dark on those yellow beaks. These two birds are interacting uh, all over Route 1A vicinity in Rye. And yeah, question? I was um, how did birds go back? We were setting it up and we saw them go Is that Rye? Is that in Rye? Okay. Uh huh. To the trees. Yeah. There's a couple of good marshes there. There's Jet Genus Marsh, I think, is one. And uh, what's the other one? Is it Alcommon Marsh? That's further down, isn't it? Anyway, there's a couple of good wetlands on the opposite side from the from the ocean, with lots of big pine trees. And um, you know, my money's on them building a nest in one of those pine trees. But uh, we haven't seen any evidence of nest building yet. So I, I I'm sure it's coming, and uh, I bet somebody sees that, and can help guide us to where the nest ends up being. Um, our lakes region has become a, a hotbed of bald eagles. There's there are eagle pairs all over. Lake Winnipesaukee and the surrounding lakes. Um, they're in this territory year round. They're sizing it up. They know every nook and cranny. They know where the good spots in an east wind is to go and hide from the wind. They know when the northwest wind blows, another spot that they can spend the night. Uh, and they know they know the, the, the boundaries of their territory and how they relate to the neighboring pairs. Occasionally, they'll get together in a food item, but they, they seem to have figured out how to create a boundary between the two and share it peacefully. This is what I'm hoping the folks in Rye will see, which is carrying sticks or even better, carrying uh, marsh grass or something like that, which they can, which they line the nest with, the dry kind of grass that the eggs will actually be laid on. And then they replace that every time it gets rained on with new dry grasses to, to keep, it's like straw in a barn, I guess, um, to keep the lambs warm. The picture on the right is not photoshopped. This is legitimate, okay? That's a pine branch. I don't know if it was pulled off a tree or whether it was picked up off the shoreline or what. That's gotta be 14 feet long, don't you think? And it did not go into the nest. It did not make it into the nest with that. But this is just remarkable, uh, the things that they'll pick up and try to carry. They don't just pick them up off the shoreline. They'll uh, 
you know, pine trees oftentimes have lots of dead branches that stick out, especially down a little below the top. Um, they'll fly in and throw their weight on that branch and try to snap it off. Um, I have seen eagles because I heard the snap and I turned to look where the snap was. And here's this eagle flying off of the branch. So um, that, so use your ears too when you're, uh, the other thing, if you're, um, if you're on a lake and the loons start making a particular call, don't look at the loons, look up because they're saying there's an eagle here. Yeah, and then they, and all the loons up and down the lake say the same thing. So, so. yeah, so, question back here. <laughs> Uh, it never yells at the osprey, no. Yeah, before you could see it, it might it might have seen it soaring or something, but yeah, yeah, yeah. They 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 really are tuned in to. I mean, think about it. Loons and eagles have shared the same environment for tens of thousands of years okay they they know how to account for each other they definitely do don't you think uh so bald eagles build big nests that persist beyond a single year they use the same nest over and over again they really in new hampshire really like super canopy pines those are the pines that stick up above all the others uh, they don't just nest in pine trees in new hampshire there are big cottonwood trees on the southern fringes of the state on along our major rivers that serve the same purpose and they're very different trees than pine trees that's for sure um, whole different structure but eagles will use those as well uh, multiple years and oftentimes nesting on islands or points or peninsulas that stick out um, and so they're surrounded by water on two or three sides at least usually um, and you can see these trees deteriorate over time because the eagles um, perch on the same branches, they actually will snap off branches and use those in their nest. See all those little stubs there. At one time, all those little stubs were branches and either with their beak or their talons or by perching on them and breaking them, uh, those were snapped off. So sometimes you can tell a well-used eagle tree because it all has all those gaps between the branches or just because there's a five foot deep and an eight foot wide nest in it, that, that's another way. Do they line the grass with them? Uh, you, you might see stuff like that. I would expect that more from ospreys to line their nest with like fishing trash and things like that. You might see that, but uh, they really do like um, grasses and um, straw. I, a farm in the Connecticut River Valley had an eagle pair nesting on the river right out front. They, um, they would report seeing both the male and female adult come in and land at the ramp into their barn and then hop into the barn and come out with hay to line their nest. So I'm not sure what the animals in the barn thought of that. <laughs> so we have eagles nesting in, 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 in beautiful semi-wilderness areas in the state, like um, some parts of the Androscoggin River, but we also have them nesting right above people's houses. This is uh, on a lake called Province Lake on the main border up in Wakefield. You see the nest is literally right above the back porch of the house. Uh, but the eagle's world is 80 feet up and looking out and they're not really focused on what's going on down there. And they've gotten accustomed to certain behaviors that happen there regularly by the people. And if you were to do something totally different than normal, you might get the eagles upset, but um, they, they account for what normal activity around them is and, and seem to be able to work with that. Well, I was, I was trying to give you some idea. Um, I mean, it's typically square-ish or I mean, oval-ish. It's typically six feet across at least. And they pile more sticks on every year and bring more hay in. Uh, some of them get to be deeper than they are wide. Now you might get an eight foot deep eagle nest over time. Problem is all that material when it's waterlogged or has a foot of wet, heavy snow on it is tremendously heavy. And um, plus the tree branches are not getting, they're not dry because they're completely surrounded by this stuff. They get wet and they deteriorate. And then eventually you'll see a branch break and the nest will fall out. 
Sometimes that happens when there's baby eagles in the nest too. But um, winter, heavy winter ice storms or, or the wet heavy snowstorms can do a lot of damage to these trees and they have to then have another place to go. And uh, if most of our pairs, if we look carefully, we'll find an alternate nest somewhere within a quarter mile of where their primary nest is. Uh, I'm gonna go a little okay, farther. Okay. Um, again, so close to the house that uh, the babies are pooping on the house. Uh, so I, I don't know if, they, if these folks uh, don't use their back porch certain times of the year or what the deal is. Um, breeding is happening now. Some of our birds are already on their eggs right now. Our eagles are on their eggs. Uh, but most pairs have been mating for weeks at this point and uh, will be soon laying eggs. Um, e uh, eagles don't mate in midair. They mate on a perch like this. And they'll, uh, they'll do it many times in the early spring. Um, a lot more times than you'd think would be necessary for to produce two, two or three eggs, that's for sure. <laughs> um, and I was saying, here's, here's a, an eagle, an eagle the size of the nest compared to the eagle. It's, that's easily eight feet across there. Um, this is a, a, a camera in Massachusetts. Gosh, 20 years ago now when, when nest cams were rare, okay? There are, I just wanna mention, there are a couple beautiful um, nest cameras now with audio in uh, Western Pennsylvania, the ones that are my favorites, they're on the, uh, I don't know if it's the Monongahela River or not, but one of the rivers that goes into Pittsburgh and, and makes the Ohio. Um, two different nests within about a mile of each other, one at the US Steel uh, Company outside of Pittsburgh, um, with somebody who works for the company who's operating the camera all the time. So if an eagle goes and perched on a branch, the camera turns over and zooms in on the eagle. Or maybe it's one of these things <laughs> that moves when I move. But, uh, and great audio, uh, it's really fantastic. And they're at the same stage of nesting now that our eagles in New Hampshire are. So you can see what might be going on in your local nest much better by looking at that camera than you can by standing uh, 150 yards away with binoculars. You can see what's going on inside the nest. You can see what hatching is like. You can see the idea of one egg hatched and one egg still needs to be incubated. That's, that's a challenge for an adult eagle is to do both those things at the same time. But um, there's little you can see from the ground that, that can tell what's going on, but uh, the cameras really help a lot. So we've come a long way from, from this camera in Massachusetts back in 1990 something. But um, if you see a bald eagle nest like this after, if we get another snowstorm next week, uh, don't assume that nest is empty just because it looks like that. You see the head there? It's a real challenge to see these things when there's snow aligning the edge of the nest because they look almost identical. You almost have to look for the yellow eye as opposed to the white part. It's really remarkable. They'll, if they have eggs, they need to keep them covered for five straight weeks day and night through whatever the weather is, whether it's 80 degrees or snowing like crazy or raining. And so uh, to do that and to keep the snow off of them, they have to keep that imprint, that spot where there's no, um, where there's no snow. Because if the snow falls down and piles around the eggs, that's it, those eggs are not gonna make it. And, uh, um, and they'll have to either start over again or skip the breeding season, either one is a possibility. Uh, once again, even after the snow is gone, eagles pile up the edge of their nest with extra sticks, especially in the direction where they perceive there's a threat. They'll pile it up a little higher on that side so that you really can't see what's going on, but they can peek out at you through the sticks. If you look really carefully, and it's so bright in here, it's really kind of hard to see this, but here's the eagle's tail right there, and here's the head and the beak. It's actually turned looking up. See the beak and the head. So you really have to watch for a while at some of these nest sites to, uh, to tell if an incubating bird is in there or not, unless you happen to be there once every three or four hours when they trade places. And then, you know, there's two eagles and they're flapping around and one flies off. And it's easy to tell because the other one disappears back into the nest again. So although they seem like they're flat on top, they are bowls. 
and they get way down low and right in the center to keep the eggs warm. So just want to impress on you that just because you don't see one doesn't mean there's not one there. Um, once the eggs hatch, they tend to sit up higher. Uh, they're keeping the chicks warm and comfortable, but they're not completely smothering them. Uh, the chicks are actually out in front of them where they can get some air, but they sit up higher uh, and actually sit back a little bit more from the center of the nest. Oftentimes the tail really sticks up in the air at this stage. And the center of the nest is where the head is. And that's where the, the chicks are underneath the adult. Um, baby eagles are in the nest for 11 to 12 weeks once the eggs hatch after five weeks of incubation. And they go through several stages. At first they have white down and they can keep that for about a week or two or a little more than that. And then they replace it with this, this gray thicker down um, that it has more warming properties. The, the white down, uh, at that point, they still have to be kept warm by the adults, but when they get this gray uh, down material, uh, that actually has enough insulation that, and their circulatory system's running good enough that they can keep themselves warm so the adults can leave the nest. This, this chick's about three and a half weeks of age at this stage. Um, go ahead. Similar, but maybe a little different timing depending on the species. You know, a kestrel would be a lot faster because it's a smaller bird and they, they fledge in, I think, eight weeks or something like that. Ospreys, though, are quite similar to eagles. They, they're, they're, well, but they're in the nest for, uh, 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 I can't say the word, eight weeks. <laughs> okay. Whereas eagles are in the nest for 11 to 12 weeks. So, and condors is even longer, but we don't have any condors around. So, these chicks are about six to seven weeks of age right here in the nest. The adults stop, stop uh, trying to, to, to get in the nest at the same time as them, except to tear up food and feed them. The chicks still really can't feed themselves at this stage. They are losing that gray down that I was mentioning before, still some on the leg, but they're replacing it with their first uh, uh, juvenile feathers the flight feathers that you assume you see on, on an adult bird or on a fledged bird. They're replacing those feathers. The feathers are growing out on all parts of the body and the birds are learning to use their extremities. Um, these chicks are more like 10 weeks of age in this picture, considerably older than the ones we just saw before, same chicks in fact. Um, and then they start exercising and trying to figure out what their wings do, and they start to figure out how to achieve lift. Um, and so they'll do a lot of flat hopping and exercising, trying to uh, coordinate between talons that grab sticks and wings that flap and get caught by the wind. And they're not very strong at this stage, but they do a lot of exercising and they do a behavior that we call helicoptering, which is pumping the wings and lifting off so they're not touching the ground at all, touching the nest at all. And they'll go up maybe three or four feet in the air doing this, and then they get tired and they drop back down onto the nest again. And they do that over and over and over again, and the other chick will watch them do it. Um, and then a breeze comes along when they're doing it, all of a sudden that they didn't expect or account for. And when they drop back down onto the nest, the nest is over there. Oh, oh, oh. And oftentimes that's how uh, young eagles fledge for the first time, leave the nest, is by accident. It's not always on purpose. And sometimes they come out um, inadvertently early because the other chick will rush for food and bump the one off the edge of the nest and they'll tumble down through the branches and end up on the ground. And I, I remember one nest that was, uh, the, we had two chicks in it until eight weeks and all of a sudden there was only one chick in the nest. And you know, that, they, don't, they don't leave the nest that early. That's not how it works. And we, you know, it was on an island and we didn't poke around underneath the nest. Um, several weeks later, here's the other chick on a, a branch about five feet above the ground on the island. It had ended up on the ground. The adults continued to feed it, and eventually it worked its way up to safety. It's a good thing it was on an island because <coughs> if it hadn't been on an island, it probably would have fallen victim to a raccoon or another predator. But in this case, there wasn't a lot of traffic onto the island by, by predators, so uh, it survived. But 
Um, a lot of challenges growing up on a eight foot wide platform of sticks. Um, but eagles seem to be quite comfortable with that as a, as a place to grow up. Um, in some cases where we have a lot of demand to see these sites where people uh, hop in their boats on weekends and all go out to the island to see what's going on, uh, we actually have to put up um, rope lines to tell people, okay, that's close enough, don't go any closer. <clears throat> these are tough to maintain, especially in, in windy weather and deep lakes, trying to keep those uh, floats in place. You have to have long sink, long, long ropes to long sinkers. It's a lot of work. And then the, the material is waterlogged and doesn't survive forever. And you got to store it every winter too. So if you work with the loon committee, you know what I'm talking about because the loon committee does this with, with loon nests on a regular basis and they've perfected it. But uh, in any case, we think long and hard before putting up a buoy line around an eagle nest for that reason. It's, it's a lot of work to maintain. But in some cases it's necessary. This is next to a bald eagle nest on Squam Lake. Um, when they nested on this island, we had to put a, a buoy line around because folks wouldn't just come out in their jet skis and sit there and look at the eagles. They would go and land on the island and walk around. And it just created so much distraction for the adults. Yes. Um, we collaborated with Fish and Game to do this. In most cases, the people doing the deployment are us. But um, <clears throat> it's it's, when we had 10 nesting pair of eagles in the state and we wanted to get every one of those chicks to make it, we did this with some regularity. Now that we have over 90 pairs of eagles in the state, we do less of it, certainly proportionally less of it than we did in the past. And people are learning eagle etiquette. It's not a strange thing anymore. So it, that helps. Um, our goal has always been in recovering this population is to try to get as many young eagles to fledge as possible because we are replenishing a diminished population. Um, this, where is this? Oh, I, I tried to put in a bunch of Seacoast pictures that would, um, that would be places you might be familiar with. If you ever take a boat out of Portsmouth and you go out to the breakwaters out at, what, what, between Kittery and uh, what's the fort? Foster. Fort Foster, right in there. There's a back way. There's a back channel over by Wentworth, Wentworth by the sea. A little narrow, you got to know the tides and all that, especially if you want to go around uh, Leech's Island, which is inside of the bridge, but which gets almost dry around it at low tide. So at high tide, you can drift past an eagle nest on Leech's Island. And if you're lucky this summer, you might see three chicks like uh, in this picture here. Three is the most eagle chicks we ever see produced by a nest. Only about 5% of our eagle nests produce three chicks to fledging. Most of them produce one or two. So the average is about one and a half chicks per nest. And that, in, that includes the ones that don't produce any because they fail. Um, one of the advantages we try to give eagles, uh, and again, something we did proportionally more in the past when we had so few nests, put metal predator guards around the trees to keep raccoons and fisher in particular, and bear for that matter, from climbing up the tree because they smell fish on the ground and, and eagle poop. And they think, oh, there's something up there and they'll climb the tree and try to find it. So by putting sheet metal wrapping around the base of the tree, you prevent that from happening, as long as there aren't other branches from other trees that they can use as ladders to get, to get there. So predator guard, predator guarding actually in a study we did with ospreys back in the 1990s, we found that on average, twice as many young osprey chicks would be produced from a nest with one of these metal wraps as was produced from a nest without metal wraps. That doesn't mean the one had two and the one had one. That means there are a lot more failures in the ones that weren't guarded. So that's a management strategy that we've employed to help boost the population. Um, if it's in a real obvious spot, we'll, we'll camouflage it so you can't see it very well with spray paint. Um, and surprisingly, it really is effective. It's a good camouflage, um, especially in places like campgrounds and things like that where you don't want to attract attention. The other is the lake shores. If you've got a sheet metal predator guard on the north side of the lake and the sun is shining on it, you can see it from five miles away because when the sun is just right because it reflects. So that's another reason to, to paint it. We've worked with a group called Biodiversity Research. Institute in Maine, uh, who 
throughout New England has helped us climb to some of these nests and examine and band the chicks. Um, I always work with them because that way I don't have to climb the tree. Um, this is what a young eagle looks like when you uh, encounter it for the first time in the nest. It's never seen a predator like you. So it reacts in an interesting way. And by the way, that is Wentworth by the sea in the background there. So you get an idea of where, where we're looking at right here. Put the eagle chick in a bag, lower it to the ground where it's much safer to work on it. And um, they're actually pretty cooperative when you, uh, when you don't try to restrain them. They act like they're still in the nest, even though they've never seen a spot like this before. Uh, we'll examine them, make sure they're healthy, that they don't have any injuries, um, any concerns like that. Um, pe uh, um, parasites, for example. And we'll put ID bands on them, um, as well as uh, taking measurements to make sure we understand their age and all that. Uh, I brought a couple of these bands with me. I'll pass them around. Uh, bald eagle bands are among the biggest leg bands that uh, bird banders put on, on, on wild birds. Um, and uh, they have easily read characters that allow us with a good camera or a spotting scope to actually verify the identity of that individual. I'm going to pass these around, extend it back that way, and then bring it back forward on the other side. Would be great. So this, how this, do they expand for the leg growing bigger? Well, it's aluminum, so you actually can pull it open if it doesn't have a rivet on it. Don't do that now, though. <laughs> um, um, so they're they're flexible enough to open them up and slide over the leg, which is like the size of my finger. And then you squeeze it back, and you'll see there's there's rivet holes on those bands. So we have to actually rivet them closed because the eagle beak could do the same thing and open it up again. So we don't want them to remove them. We want it to stay on them for the next 20 years. So, and these bands are large enough that they'll fit on the size of the legs of bald eagles. I see I'm running close on time, so I'm gonna to try to keep going here. Um, so, you know, we'll put these bands on these birds, put them back in the nest, and then, you know, they go through the rest of their fledging. This guy's eight weeks old, maybe, this one who's getting the leg band. It's a handful, but he's not ready to fly yet. So they'll continue uh, to develop in the nest, uh, fledge from the nest. And if we're lucky in a year or two or five or 10, or in some cases, 15 years, someone gets a picture of that individual bird and uh, we figure out where it's dispersed to. And in some cases we know how long it's been nesting in a new location and how far that is from where it was raised and how many years it's been nesting with a mate who happens to also be like banded. So uh, we, we get some good information from that um, in terms of how many years an eagle can survive. The oldest known bald eagle in the country uh, in the wild uh, was found just a couple of years ago in, I believe it was Wisconsin, it was 38 years old. And the only reason we know that is because they knew when they put that ID band on the bird. So. It's plausible that an eagle might live 40 years in the wild, but it would be extremely rare. Probably less than 1% of, of the eagles would survive that long. Uh, the adults continue to feed them after they fledge from the nest. Um, the young are more than happy to accept food from the adults uh, and then follow them on hunts, try to figure out how to open up carcasses, um, how to catch things on their own. But uh, oftentimes they'll stay around till October November, even December, before they disperse uh, in, in their first winter. Uh, this is a picture of one of our banded birds. Um, that, I think that might even be the same one I was showing you earlier that was in my arms. Um, two years later, in the Hudson Bay watershed, or Hudson Bay, uh, Hudson River watershed of New York, excuse me, um, we thought, oh, sure, this guy's made it. He'll be back in New Hampshire in a few years and we'll see him. We never have seen that bird again. So. Um, whether it's alive or not, we don't know. Maybe we'll find it in the next few weeks. Maybe it's nesting over at Chapman's Landing. We'll have to see. Photographers help a lot. I used to, I used to not tell wild, uh, photographers where nests were because uh, I was afraid they would harass the birds. That's not really fair of me. These guys have incredible pictures and, and can, with, with lenses, they can get shots that you can't get otherwise. We can get IDs off of some of these birds from the pictures that photographers are getting. Um, I just have to convince them not to not to delete all the bad pictures. <laughs> you know, you know they, they, 
they want that wonderful shot of the eagle soaring. And I, I want the one that just shows the leg, you know? <laughs> so anyway, uh, again, some more case. I don't, is that blurry for you? It feels blurry to me. That may be my eyes. I shouldn't, I shouldn't bother. It's just, this is a mistake. Don't do it. See, look at that. Mistake. Don't do it. Um, oh my gosh. I ruined it. What is going on? <laughs> Anyway, um, a lot of uh, probably thirty percent of our eagles have ID bands on. It's not the majority anymore, um, but you never know when you're going to find one. And so sometimes photographers say, "I took pictures of these eagles today," and when I got back home and I looked at them on my computer, I realized something I didn't realize before, which is that it had an ID tag. So I get a lot of people reporting that to me. So just want to mention the co coalition of people involved in this. Agencies like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and, and New Hampshire Fish and Game, um, a lot of volunteers, these other organizations like Biodiversity, I mentioned them earlier, they do a lot of great science in Maine and beyond. Um, and half these nests are on private land, not on, not on conserved public land. So we work with a lot of individual landowners who find out one way or the other that they have eagles nesting on their property. Some of them call me. Sometimes I call them and say, oh, by the way, did you know? And uh, it's not hard to live with these guys, these eagles. You just have to, there's a few things you need to do in terms of time of year uh, to avoid disturbance. So uh, a lot of different funders over the years, groups like Trans Canada, which used to operate all the dams on the Connecticut River. They were a big supporter of our work. Uh, foundations like the Door Foundation, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation have helped fund the work. Fish and Game helps fund our work but only part of it. So uh, we're still trying to monitor all the Eagle fairs across the state. And so that takes um, uh, more resources than is available in an annual grant that we get from the Fish and Game Department. So uh, we're always eager to look for support and we take donations from the public too. So just so you know that. Um, I wanna show you some results. We talked a lot about breeding eagles, but I haven't told you any numbers really yet. Um, through night, through uh, 2022, uh, we've had a lot of change over time. We only had one nest in the state in the early 1990s. It took forever to find that second nest. And, but in the time since, we've gone from one or two nests to 92 territorial pairs and 72 definite confirmed nests that are active last year, with 51 of those being successful in raising at least one chick. We had 84 young last year. It's the most we've ever had in a single year. And, uh, and like I said, we have taken them completely off of our state uh, threatened list now. Um, best, like I said at the start, best way to do is show it in a graph. So um, here's a different graph. This is breeding season, okay? From 1988 to 2022, we've seen the population grow at a tremendous rate in the last 20 years, um, essentially doubling about every six years. Since about the year 2000, it's been doubling every six years. And if you know anything about graphs and lines, this one is still going up at a pretty good slope. What you expect in a wild population is to see the population reach a carrying capacity where the population flattens out and remains relatively stable, unless it's a population that goes up and down a lot. That's another possibility. But you, you have to use your imagination here to see this curve flattening out. I kind of see it but it's not there yet. We're still uh, growing our eagle population. And if we continue at the current pace by the year 2030, instead of having nearly a hundred nesting pairs, we'll have 200 nesting pairs in the state. I'm not sure we'll get there. I think we're gonna flatten out soon, but you know, what do I know? I've, I've just worked with eagles for 30 years. I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, and you know, the eagle population impacts other animals. So there's all kinds of feedback loops in there. The question I always get is what about the loons? You know, if there's eagles on every lake, aren't the loons gonna have trouble? Um, we've actually studied that with the Loon Preservation Committee. We found that eagle predation represents less than 3% of the loss of loon chicks every year. There are a lot of other factors that make a bigger dent. However, Eagles is one more thing that they have to deal with. So 
you know, it, it, it's, I don't want to say it's good or bad. It's, it's somewhere in the middle. And, and loons, like I said, have spent thousands of years learning to live with eagles. It's only in the last 50 years that they've had a break from that challenge. And um, they seem to have genetically remembered how to deal with them pretty well. So uh, we're not seeing much loss to, of, of eggs or chicks to, uh, to eagles by the loons. And believe me, people are watching the list. So I think we'd hear about it if that was happening on a regular basis. The one time that it is a risk is when loons get caught in, in ice. There's only a little water left in January, for example. You, you hear about loon rescues. That's the time when they're very vulnerable if there are any eagles on those frozen lakes. Because um, if it freezes in too close, the eagles can get a hold of those loons when they come up for air. So that's, that's probably the riskiest time of the year to an adult loon, at least. I think I'm almost done here. Um, another way to look at it is look at a map. This map is from 2021. It's not last year's map, but it gives you the idea. It's gotten to the point, if I want to list the territories, I can't do it on the same page anymore. There's just too many of them. Um, red triangles are New Hampshire territories. Blue dots are territories that the nest is on the other side of the state line. So the Connecticut River has a mixture of New Hampshire and Vermont side nests um, every, every four miles all the way up the river on average um, from Massachusetts all the way up to Pittsburgh. And, and the lakes region is quite a cluster now. You see how compact that is uh, with, with nesting pairs of eagles. And you can even make out where the Merrimack River is in this picture. Going right down here from Newfound Lake all the way down past Concord and down to Manchester and down to Nashville. And the Seacoast area has got a good collection and that doesn't include this new parent rye because they're too new to be on, on this map. So um, you can see there's only one real part of the state where there isn't um, a likelihood of you seeing nesting bald eagles. That's the White Mountains. And uh, they, there are so few lakes and major rivers in that area that uh, it's not a good, good habitat for bald eagles. It is good for golden eagles and that may be where we See, you know, Franconia Notch may be where we see our first nesting pair of golden eagles, for example. So uh, I'm trying to wrap this up now because I know we're at three o'clock. Eagles are off our list in New Hampshire. There are, I think I've tried to explain there are multiple reasons for us to continue to monitor them as best we can. Uh, I know there's a day coming when we won't have, be able to say roughly how many pairs we have in the state. I'm hopeful that that graph at that point will be a good, reliable predictor of what the number really is. Um, and as long as we continue to monitor that nests are producing young, we can be relatively certain that we're not seeing um, a chemical issue that's causing the population to crash. That would be the worst case scenario is to have a chemical that does that. Now there is one, I, I know somebody in the back is gonna speak up about this. The one that concerns, concerns me the most now is the second generation rodenticides. Uh, there are things that are in those black boxes that the rats go in and they eat, but they're allowed to leave again and wander around carrying this burden of poison in their body. Um, and then they're vulnerable as to cats and dogs and uh, raccoons and eagles and everybody else, owls, the whole, you know, everybody could eat those and the chemicals still in them. And so then it, it impacts the uh, predator as well. So they're, this is an issue we really got to deal with, which we don't have a good handle on right now is how to, I mean, and the irony of the whole thing with these, with these chemicals is you're impacting the predators that actually are the predators on the mice and the rats. And you're killing them off, which means you're gonna have more mice and rats. It's kind of, it, it's crazy. So I'm sorry if there are any pest control folks in the crowd, but it, it, it's not, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. So, all right, last, last point. Uh, I hear more and more people bringing up the question of, aren't eagles kind of um, a problem now? Don't we have too many eagles? Mm -hmm. And I, of course, I disagree with that, but uh, we do have more and more conflict with our other wildlife species. This is the nest at Chapman's Landing, the osprey nest at Chapman's Landing. And the eagle pair there has tried to nest in that in the past, and they use it as a perch site in the wintertime. But recently they have built their own nest in a pine tree. And so ospreys and eagles can both live in the neighborhood uh, together. And it's, it's in the eagle's best interest because the ospreys can catch fish for them. 
So <laughs> uh, we've even had successful eagles uh, raise young on osprey nests. This one's down in the Monadnock region, actually. We also have the issue of eagles scavenging on roadsides. And because eagles don't take off by flying straight up in the air, they are vulnerable to being hit by vehicles when they take off low, which is their method of, of flying away. They fly away from the road, that's great, but that's a problem because there's usually barriers like this. So they end up uh, encountering a truck or a vehicle and smacking into it, uh, brought to that spot because there's a, a, a dead deer or other food item. So uh, uh, eagles coming into uh, traffic issues is, is uh, one, of, one of the other challenges that they face. We work with wildlife rehabilitators like Maria Colby at Wings of Dawn in Henniker. She has specialized in bald eagles for us for about 20 years and helps us rehabilitate some of these birds and, and give them a second chance to get back in the wild. Um, so we've had cases where fishing game has picked up a sick eagle out of the river, brought them to Maria, and uh, she gives them good food, and they go to see the vets, uh, make sure that they are have they get x-rays and exams to make sure they're in good shape. And then we try to put ID bands on them and release them back to the wild. I'll show you an example of that real quick. I think this is the end of my show when I show you this. Uh, releasing, this actually, this is great because we had one of the folks who photographs the eagles at this site, um, helped collect this bird when it was injured, bring it to the wildlife rehabilitator, and uh, now the guy on the left is present for releasing that bird again. And off it goes. Same picture from a different angle. A young bird that may not, we may find that bird in the next year or two. It may be part of a breeding pair somewhere. The last, last story really quick. Some strange things I've seen in 30 years. Uh, halfway between here and Concord on Bow Lake, there's a bald eagle nest. Yeah. And, and this is great. Do you know this story? Okay. <laughs> so here's a baby eagle on the left side of that picture. Um, only one chick that year. And at some point, apparently, one of the adult eagles, probably the male, raided a red-tailed hawk nest, grabbed a baby red-tailed hawk, maybe at the same time it grabbed a squirrel, who knows, carried it back to the eagle nest and dropped it in the nest. You see over on the right side that downy bird? That is a baby red-tailed hawk. The female eagle, at least, was feeding both of them, feeding them food, fish. And this red-tailed hawk chick developed and fledged from that nest alongside the uh, eagle chick. Here it is a few weeks later. Okay, Eagle chick on the left, red-tailed hawk chick on the right. No word from whether this red-tailed hawk chick is a fish eater now or not, but it's not normal for red-tailed hawks to do that. But this this baby hawk fledged from that nest and it was raised by the fema, the, the parent eagles. I'm not sure. I There's no other way around it. I mean, the red-tailed hawk didn't fly into the nest and lay an egg in that nest. It didn't happen that way. <coughs> the timing was all wrong for that. Even if it could happen, the timing was all wrong. So this young chick, got carried into that nest by somebody and became uh, an adopted uh, baby bird. So uh, stranger things, that's for sure. So you never know what you're gonna see next with eagles. They, they are uh, fun to watch because they're big, easy to see, and uh, lots of good stuff, lots of stories. I could tell you, I could go on forever. Um, but the reason we continue to track these guys is because they are good uh, bio sentinels. They tell us about our aquatic environment. They tell us about the quality of the fish. They tell us about water quality. And uh, we need to keep track of, of these kind of predators because they tell us a lot about the things that we're eating as well. You know how many fish cautions there are uh, about the quality of, of the fish you're eating. So uh, knowing that eagles are surviving gives us some sense of what's going on in our food chain as well. So I just want to acknowledge all those photographers that helped us uh, present this show. Some really uh, wonderful experiences. If you do wildlife photography and you want to do something fun, I can suggest a place for you to go if you promise to send me some of your pictures, okay? Um, seriously, it, it's a lot of fun and people really love to have a point of going to these spots. You know, it's, I mean, it's a, for, 
I don't have to say this right away. It's a non-consumptive form of hunting. You can hunt for the thing you're looking for and just take all the pictures you want and, uh, and help us manage the population. So it's really, it's a win-win for everybody. Thanks to everybody for coming today. I'd be happy to stay and answer questions. I just want my leg bands back. <laughs> so, yes, yeah. Moving to Burlington GPS or radio transmitters, we, um, there are plenty of bald eagles in the country that have where GPS tracking devices or satellite tracking devices. <clears throat> we, we, uh, we experimented with that one time, well, a couple times in New Hampshire. We put transmitters with the help of our friends at uh, Biodiversity Research in Maine. We put transmitters on I want to say three juvenile eagles. You have to go into the nest when they're full size to do that because the, the transmitters are like backpacks and they strap on. So you can't put it on a chick because it's going to throw too big. But you have to climb up and get a 10 week old baby eagle, bring it to the ground, put the transmitter on it. We did that three nests in the lakes region. We found those three eagle chicks went three different places. Two from the same nest went two different places. One went to Pennsylvania, another one went to northern New Jersey, and the third one went to uh, um, coastal Connecticut, all three different spots. And they wandered all over the, the place in the, in the winter months. Uh, one, one died in, in December. It, it um, got hit by a vehicle in its first December. Um, one of them, one of them uh, is, uh, has lost its transmitter now, but it still has its leg man and it's breeding it in, uh, in near Concord um, after, after years now, it's 10 years, I think. Um, anyway, so they, uh, what really I, I learned from that was how much wandering around these young birds do. They don't just go south and then come back north. They go south and then they go west and then they go east and then they pop north and then they go south again. Uh, they, they're just trying to learn the ropes and be an eagle. And uh, it means following the crowd, going wherever the food is and uh, following other eagles around, I think. So anyway, that's it. Other questions, let's start over there. Oh, I know where that is. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's an osprey nest, but you better check it. It could have an eagle in it. Yeah. So, so I didn't, I didn't really mention this. Let me say this. Um, eagles prefer to have some canopy over the top. Uh, they prefer to get some shade. And so they'll nest usually in a live, excuse me, I'm sorry about my throat today. A live tree um, and down about 20% from the top oftentimes. Ospreys for one reason or another, like to be able to be exposed to everything and be able to see everything in every direction. So they'll nest on the, with no shelter over their heads, almost every time. You rarely see an osprey nest underneath anything else. They want to know, they want to see the whole sky, probably because of, they've been conditioned to by eagles, to be able to see that eagle coming if it's going to raid the nest. So, uh, and, and take the fish from the side of the nest. So if you see, a nest on a telephone pole or something that looks like a telephone pole or a cell tower, it's almost certainly in New Hampshire to be an osprey nest, not an eagle nest. So, yes. Um, I've been following Sandville Island recovery and there's four nesting um, there, there now. Of eagles? Of eagles, okay. yeah. And um, what about red tide, which is really bad there? How will that affect uh, you know, it's not something I have experience with because we haven't had those issues in New Hampshire. So I could only speculate. You probably know as much about it as I do. Um, if, if, if it's a chemical that, or if it's a poison that persists in prey and things die, there's a good chance eagles are going to get exposed to it. I mean, that's the pattern. So if it persists as a secondary poison, then eagles should be worried about it. And anything that eats, Anything that eats those um, exposed animals should be concerned. So I, I don't know enough about the tide itself. So uh, any more before we say good, goodbye? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.